I would like to introduce the coconut rhinoceros, rhinoceros beetle response team that will be giving, sharing with us this information about the unique case of coconut rhinoceros beetle in Hawaii. So um, Kylie Kosaka is an outreach specialist with the coconut rhinoceros beetle response team. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies with a minor in Business Administration from the University of Hawaii at Hilo and a certificate of, in the Visual Arts from the University of Hawaii Maui College. She has worked with native Hawaiian flora at the Department of Land and Natural Resources Division of Forestry and Wildlife on Kauai and the Maui Nui Botanical Garden. And she's also worked in marketing and communication with the Maui Tropical Plantation. We also have Koki Atchison, sorry, Koki, is an outreach specialist, sorry? Okay, with, she is an outreach specialist with the Coconut Rhinoceros Beetle Response Team. She graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in the Environmental Science and a minor in Education from Colorado College. Before joining the Coconut Rhinoceros Beetle Response Team, Koki worked in communications for conservation advocacy and environmental education roles. It's a very impressive background for both of you. And one last thing before I hand this over to you ladies to give this talk. If anybody joining us today has any questions, has any questions. Please, please enter them into the question and answer box or the chat box or as a comment on the Facebook Live. And we'll be addressing all of those after the talk. So thank you very much. Take it away, ladies. Hi, thank you so much for that introduction, Elizabeth. Um, Kylie and I are really glad to be here and able to give this talk on um, coconut rhinoceros beetle in Hawaii. So we try to go a little bit more in depth than our standard talk about CRB um, to compare what's unique about um, the situation here um, compared to some of the other locations where CRB has invaded. So without further ado, let's get started. So this is a coconut rhinoceros beetle um, or Arictes rhinoceros. It's about a two or two and a half inch beetle with a prominent horn um, and it's solid black and uh, an invasive species here in Hawaii. Looking a little bit about the life cycle of coconut rhinoceros beetle, um, these uh, statistics were observed in our lab at the University of Hawaii at 30 degrees Celsius. So, um, one unique aspect is with the growth conditions and timing of the moving through different life stages of the CRB, it's very environmentally dependent. So what we've observed, uh, what we've observed here is that CRB will spend about two weeks of their life as an egg, and then they'll progress through larval instar phases. So two weeks in the first larval instar, um, about two more weeks in the second larval instar, and then um, three to five months as the third larva instar. And these are the really big larvae that you may have seen um, photos or videos of on our social media. So three to four inches in size before the larvae will pupate for about two to three re weeks and then emerge as an adult. And here in Hawaii, we've seen that they live for about three to five or more months. So why do we care about coconut rhinoceros beetle and why is there a dedicated coconut rhinoceros beetle response? Um, it's because of the impacts that CRB cause to palms. So looking around at some of the signs of damage and how the CRB feed on those palms, um, they bore into coconut palms, but also other palm trees, which we'll go into in a moment. Um, and at the base of the fronds, um, close to the heart of the palm, um, they will use their strong front arms to burrow in to get the um, juices at the center of the palm, that innermost sphere. And then when the sphere emerges, it'll have these distinctive V cuts with scalloped edges on the leaflets. Um, and all of that is symbol of uh, coconut rhinoceros beetle damage. So how that occurs, um, they can look a little bit different and they're not always on both sides of the front. So depending on where the borehole occurs um, on the unemerged leaflets that will affect the the way the v-cut shows up once the frond is fully matured. So not just coconut palms are at risk we've also seen death to our native lolu um, palms here 
And um, so this is a big concern, um, you know, for the different values of different types of palms, um, especially when we've seen full death to these trees, unfortunately, at the Leeward Community College campus. Um, so a newer project of ours is working with DOFA and OANRP to deploy more traps in some of the native lowland forests. We're working out some logistics with how often those traps can be monitored and still be effective in catching the coconut rhinoceros beetle. So healthy palms are so valuable in so many different ways. Everything from the cultural value um, to the economic value of date palm, um, especially in California and Florida, if we were to see further spread of CRB, coconut palm, of course, um, oil palm, especially in some of the uh, native range in Southeast Asia where oil palm industry is um, prevalent there. And then in Hawaii, definitely with tourism and the landscaping value of palms, um, all important reasons to protect these trees and then the ecosystem services and habitats they provide, of course. And what's at risk if coconut rhinoceros beetle get out of control here in Hawaii? Um, you might notice this iconic view um, down in Waikiki to Kahanamoku statue. If CRB were to attack all of these trees, multiple feeding events leading to the death of the palms, this is how those palms might look. And some estimates of the replacement cost of one coconut palm go up to $3,000. So imagining what it would cost to recreate these landscapes if CRB were to get out of control. So going into a little bit more about how coconut rhinoceros beetle have spread out of their native range and how they're distributed. This map um, is taken from a researcher, Dr. Moore from the University of Guam. And it shows the CRB's native range in Southeast Asia and then other places throughout the Pacific where CRB have been detected. And so we'll go into some of those different waves of introduction to new areas in a moment. Um, but notably here, we can see this um, filled circle versus the open circle uh, has to do with the different biotype, the CRB G type. So um, when we look into different biocontrol methods or um, treatment options, the biotype of the CRB makes a big difference in what's viable here in Hawaii. So the first wave of movement um, started in 1909 and um, ended in 1970. So that was primarily those um, places in the Pacific south of the equator. In Palau, Palau is notable um, because of the movement activity linked to World War II. And unfortunately, Palau saw about half of total palm mortality um, so definitely something that we want to catch early and prevent the spread to new islands where there might not be predators of coconut rhinoceros beetle. Looking into the second wave, starting around 2007, we saw um, spread to Guam. And then in Oahu, first detection was in December of 2013, as well as other Pacific islands. And notably here too, there is the presence of the CRBG or Guam biotype, um, which is resistant to uh, the Erichthys nudivirus, which is a biocontrol method. So looking into some of the factors, especially human factors that affected the spread of CRB, agriculture, shipping, war, and tropical storms, along with globalization, expedite the spread of invasive species, including coconut rhinoceros beetle. So specific one um, biocontrol method that we wanted to call out here in this presentation is the, like I mentioned, Erichthys rhinoceros nudivirus. So this um, in the 1900s was able to help suppress CRB population in Southeast Asia, but the G biotype of CRB is resistant to Erichthys nudivirus. So uh, it's not a viable biocontrol option. We had to think um, creatively about other ways to stop CRB here. And here's a list of some of the things that have been researched um, by our research team for control of CRB in Hawaii. I won't go through all of these, but the main point is to say that a lot of different treatment options from trapping, pathogens, um, chemical treatment options, and physical options have all been um, explored as potential treatments for CRB, some of which we use um, specifically here, which Kylie will go into next. And then um, we rely a lot on research from Guam um, since we have a 
comparable biotype of CRB. And we are really thankful to researchers at the University of Guam for providing us with some um, initial context to go on our uh, management plans. Um, unfortunately, Guam was hit really hard by coconut rhinoceros beetles. So this uh, photo taken in 2016 shows what it looks like with multiple um, incidences of CRB feeding on those trees um, and basically dead standing palms as a result. Some of the factors that affected the rapid spread throughout Guam, um, one is that it first was detected on the wetter side of the island. CRB really prefer um, moist material, uh, wetter conditions and are able to, um, you know, it helps with their breeding process to have that kind of moisture. Um, also in Guam, there's a lack of natural predators and some of those biocontrol treatment options didn't work. Um, we're lucky in Hawaii to have a good funding position um, and agencies who are willing to provide us the monetary support required um, to stop CRB. And then other invasive species, the impacts can compound. For example, the brown tree snake introduction uh, limited some of the potential predators for CRB in Guam. Finally, natural disasters uh, can really uh, accelerate the availability of green waste. So the 2015 typhoon dolphin um, was a big uh, factor in creating the potential breeding material for CRB in Guam. So um, with that, we don't wanna see Hawaii go into the kind of uh, damage that we saw in Guam. Um, and so we'll go to compare to Hawaii next. Koki. Yeah, so um, now to kind of get into what the purpose of this talk um, is really all about, and that's the unique case of coconut rhinoceros beetle in Hawaii. So this section will talk about how uh, coconut rhinoceros beetle and our response program is impacted by Hawaii's um, unique ecology, economy, and geopolitical landscape. Um, so if you'll recall from a previous slide that Koki mentioned, uh, we're currently in the second wave of um, infestation throughout the Pacific, and that began, began in 2007 with that first detection in Guam. And um, the main differentiation between the first and second uh, wave of introduction is really due to the uh, G biotype or the Guam biotype. So, um, that was found through genetic testing, which is um, a 21st century advancement and something that has um, been uh, helpful for us in um, discovering how the uh, population has advanced over the Pacific. And uh, for us, the um, first detection occurred in December of 2013. Um, and it actually occurred December 24th, so right um, Christmas Eve, not a present that anyone was hoping to get for Christmas. Um, and here it's important to make that distinction between detection and arrival. We actually don't know when coconut rhinoceros beetle arrived, um, nor do we know exactly how it arrived. Um, what we can say with certainty is that it was detected in 2013. And, uh, because it was detected, or, or when it was detected, a breeding population was already discovered. We assume that it arrived here um, sometime before then. Um, and two bre breeding populations were found at Mamala Bay Golf Course, and this is on the leeward side of Oahu, sort of near the airport. Um, and because there are commercial and military flights coming into that area, it's really hard to say um, how exactly it arrived here. Um, but because it was the leeward side of the island, we were um, slightly, I guess, lucky. It's kind of a hard word to say here, but we were lucky in that it was the leeward or the drier side of the island because we know that coconut rhinoceros beetle prefer those wetter climates. Um, we are also uh, thankful that the land managers there were accessible and willing to cooperate with us. Um, and uh, because a lot of the research that Guam did of uh, Prior to it arriving in Hawaii, we were able to build on top of some of that research from our Pacific partners and um, 
were in a, a little bit of a better position and didn't need to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Um, so this animation we created to show how our annual finds have progressed over the entire course of the um, program. So you'll see that it kind of starts as two small dots at Mamala Bay Golf Course, and then uh, slowly spreads throughout the rest of the, um, uh, I guess, the central part of Oahu. Um, our main hotspots continue to be and have been for a long time, um, Pearl City Peninsula, Iroquois Point, and kind of all of the area in between. So Waipio Peninsula, um, Eva Beach, Waipahu are, are um, pretty high catch areas for us too. But what we're concerned about is the spread to central Oahu and um, out into the west side of Oahu too. And um, yeah, I think it's important to note here too that coconut rhinoceros beetle hasn't reached all parts of Oahu. So that's a big success of our program that we've been able to contain it to um, these easier to manage areas. Um, but in the next slide, you'll see that we are seeing some human vectored spread throughout the island that does have us concerned. So this is what the current status of coconut rhinoceros beetle looks like in Hawaii. And um, important to note also that we haven't detected coconut rhinoceros beetle on any of the outer Hawaiian islands. So um, it's mainly an Oahu problem at this point. Um, this is what our trap detections look like between June and December of 2020. Um, like I mentioned, Pearl City Peninsula is kind of our hottest spot on the island, um, Iroquois Point and Waipio Peninsula. And then we're seeing some of that spread out into central and west Oahu. Um, also, you can see on this map some of those outlier catches that we recently discovered, um, one in Pupukea, uh, one in Marine Corps base out in Kaneohe, and then um, all the way out in Makua. And we know that coconut rhinoceros beetle can fly up to two miles at a time. So um, because this is so far of, out of where we would expect to find coconut rhinoceros beetle, we believe that this is human vectored or meaning that um, people have helped to move the, the beetle population along uh, primarily through what we assume is movement of green waste or infested material out of these hotspot areas. And another way to visualize this information is by looking at our monthly trap detections from the beginning of the program. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about our traps in a later slide, but they're our primary mode for um, understanding population dynamics. So it's we have um, tons of traps all over the island and they alert us to new detections of populations. So uh, the CRB response started in February of 2014 and uh, the population kind of remained steady for a few years into the program. Um, but in recent years, we have seen a, an increase in detection. So that does have us concerned um, and for a long time, the program was a bit more on the, the defense of the problem, you know, under, trying to understand population dynamics and um, doing more research into how we can stop the spread here in Hawaii. But we're moving into a phase where we have more treatment options available at our disposal. So it's a really exciting time to be a part of the program. And I think that um, with some of our new treatment options, we'll be able to um, affect the population. Um, so what is the current research that's going on in Hawaii regarding CRB? Um, we have partners at the University of Hawaii that are doing some really exciting stuff. There's Dr. Mike Melzer, who's also a principal investigator of our program. Um, he's studying RNAi, which I actually have some notes on so that I don't butcher any um, talk about RNAi. Um, so it's a very complicated process, but the easiest way for me to explain it is as a species-specific birth control. So RNAi um, is a D, sort of like a DNA interference kind of thing, or RNA is different 
DNA, obviously, but it's a biological process in which RNA molecules are neutralized. So you can basically turn off um, uh, specific characteristics. And uh, where the project is at right now, we know that the RNAi works um, when it's injected or you know um, directly applied to CRB larvae. Um, so what we're working on now is um, how can we use this and deploy it in a real life situation in the field. Um, so because it deteriorates really quickly in um, soil or mulch where we would be applying it, we have to encapsulate it in a lipid or a fat to extend the longevity of its effectiveness. Um, so right now that's what we're working on and um, hopefully can get that up and running soon. We're also, uh, or Dr. Melzer is also working with the vacuum steam unit, um, which I'll explain a little bit more in some of our later slides and pesticide application, um, mainly grass, or, sorry, granular pesticide application um, in comparison to some of the other pesticide um, deployments that we're experimenting with. And then there's Dr. Dan Jenkins. Um, he's working on camera traps, which are really exciting. Um, so basically it's a little uh, Wi-Fi powered camera that we can put into our trap cups and they'll alert us to when a CRB may be in the cup. So this would be really um, helpful for us in some of our rem remote locations where we can't, um, or where it's really labor intensive to send field crew out to inspect an empty cup. Um, this uh, technology can help alert us to when there may be something in there and basically make our, our trap servicing more effective. Um, he's also working on UAV pesticide application. Um, drones are everywhere and drones are the future. So um, he's working on uh, using drones to apply pesticide into the crowns of palms. Um, I don't know if any of you have tried to uh, deploy pesticides into the crown of palms, but uh, without a cherry picker or really good climbing shoes, it's very difficult. So um, we're hoping to use drones to um, help with that as well. And then there's Dr. Chang, who's working on pesticide injections, which is a really, really exciting um, new treatment method that we uh, have seen some initial positive results, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and then biocontrol fungus. We also got word from his grad student, Mason, that um, some of the other pesticides that they've been experimenting with have been effective. So we're hoping that um, with a little bit more uh, different pesticides at our disposal, we'll, we'll be more effective in um, our treatment methods in the future. Um, so the CRB response is our program that Koki and I work for. And it was um, founded in February of 2014. So we actually just celebrated our seven year anniversary of the program. And um, our program is a, oh, next slide, Koki. This one, Kylie, or? Um... Okay. Yeah, this side. Thank you. <laughs> um, so our our program is an emergency. Okay, sorry, I think I got kicked out there for a second. Um, it's raining pretty hard at my house right now. Um, so our program is a little bit unique compared to other programs. Uh, we're an emergency response effort in collaboration, uh, mainly between Hawaii Department of Agriculture, um, the University of Hawaii, and a few other partners. Um, there was a strong position for the CRB response to um, come online after the first detection, which we're really lucky for, uh, to be a part of. Um, we are, uh, we have some very well-funded research partners, um, mainly the USDA, and also get some support from the Navy um, and other government agencies. Um, 
USDA has a vested interest in our program specifically because of the national risk that CRB poses to other parts of the US. Um, there is a huge date industry in California that could completely be devastated if coconut rhinoceros beetle did arrive there. So Hawaii is kind of the gatekeeper of the Pacific for um, not just invasive species, but lots of other things too that the US is concerned about. And then um, because of our partners in Guam kind of starting research on the G uh, biotype, we were able to build on some of that as well. Um, we are also the highest funded single species response in Hawaii. Um, so we're in a unique position to um, combat coconut rhinoceros beetle. And uh, one of the main functions of our, our field crew is uh, monitoring our traps. So we have um, over 3,000 traps island-wide that monitor for coconut rhinoceros beetle. And they, their primary function isn't to remove every beetle from the environment, which I think confuses a lot of people. Um, we use them primarily to alert us to new populations and understand where we should be focusing our efforts. So it's a really big job for our field crew to check those traps and all of them are checked every one to four weeks. Um, so how do the traps work? There's a pheromone scent or allure in the trap and that's what attracts the beetle to it. Um, we know that CRB, if they're in an environment that has a lot of other things that they're attracted to like mulch and palms, then the traps aren't going to work as effectively, um, but they'll fly towards the trap, fall into the cup, or fall in, or hit the, sorry, <laughs> they'll fly towards the trap, hit the panel, and then fall into the cup. Um, the panels are black because CRB are night active, so we believe that it's harder for them to see the black panels. And then um, because their wingspan is greater than the hole at the top of the cup, they can't escape, and then our field crew comes by to collect them. Um, so we believe that uh, one of the more effective ways to affect the um, or to affect the population or to reach our goal of eradication is to disrupt the breeding cycle by treating mulch. So uh, we commonly say that if CRB have something to breed in and something to feed on, they're not going to go far. So looking at where they breed and where they feed, uh, we can come up with different ways of how to um, treat the population. Um, so because they breed in decaying plant material like compost, mulch, or green waste, we really focus a lot on the movement of that material and um, that's how we're, we're, or where we're looking to detect populations of CRB. Um, so one of the newer additions to our program is our canine team. And uh, we have two canines and one handler with a new hire starting um, actually next, next week. So March 1st, we're really excited. Um, the dogs are trained to smell CRB larvae. So we know that they can they can smell CRB, but we are currently working on um, how effective they are in detecting it in certain environments. So um, dog training is really specific and um, we'd love to talk more about it if we could. Um, so please contact us if you're interested in hearing more about our canine team. Um, but they primarily help us uh, detect breeding sites or um, through surveys. And um, some other methods of green waste management and mitigation that we uh, promote are grinding and chipping so that physical disturbance will kill um, CRB at all life stages, um, burning or any heat uh, treatment like hot composting will kill CRB um, if it reaches temperatures above 130 to 140 degrees. Um, there's also some physical treatments like searching and turning, um, which is 
pretty labor intensive. So it's something that we're kind of moving away from uh, for our field crew, but it's still an effective way to find coconut rhinoceros beetle. And then in um, warmer areas that are not irrigated, sometimes we recommend spreading material thin, and that's to reduce the, um, the suitability for coconut rhinoceros beetle to breed in that. Um, and then some of our, our newer treatment methods are pesticides in the vacuum steam unit, which I'll get into in the next slides. So pesticide use, this is kind of um, going back to a little bit of the research that um, is going on at the University of Hawaii. There are granular pesticides that we can use at breeding sites. Um, some of the issues around that is that uh, oftentimes they're permitted for lawn use. So there's an issue with the efficacy of using it in deep mulch piles or like if it's legal to use it in, in mulch piles. Um, basically the chipped material should be spread thin and then um, treated according to the label. And it's not a 100% effective method. So um, it is something that we can apply prophylactic prophylactively or um, if we find a breeding site and the landowner is open to pesticide use, but we do have some other options as well. Um, and then tree injections is really exciting for us. Um, it's something that we can use in landscaped areas where trees are trimmed every six months to reduce effect on pollinators. Uh, basically, we take the same active ingredient pesticide in a liquid form and inject it into the trees. Um, it does take some time for it to reach the crown before it becomes effective, um, but it does uh, kill CRB if they feed on that. And um, we did a 300 plus tree treatment at Waikele Country Club, and then um, more recently completed a thousand plus tree treatment at a Capulina Housing in Iroquois Point, and it has shown some initial positive results, which we're excited about. Um, so if we think back to the coconut rhinoceros beetle life cycle, um, uh, they can lay over 90 eggs in their lifetime. Um, so if we can get them before they lay their eggs, then um, we think that that's an effective way of disrupting the breeding cycle. Um, so thinking back to what Koki was talking about, about how long they, they um, spend their lives in each of these life cycles, we have come up with some um, information about how we expect the tree in injection um, treatment to go into the future. Um, so how do they work? Basically, we inject the trees with the pesticide. It's um, a metacloprid-based pesticide. Um, it takes about three months for the pesticide to travel into the injection or from the injection site to the crown and reach levels that are lethal to CRB. Um, during that time, that three-month window, the adults in the environment will continue to lay eggs and um, those eggs still need to go through their life cycle before they become feeding adults. Um, so based on the timeline and thinking about the breeding cycle, we can make some estimates onto where we think, um, uh, or I guess a timeline for um, how long before the pesticide becomes an effective um, control for the area. Um, yeah, so basically we, we assume seven to nine months after treatment is when we'll see the, um, the most effect to the population. The next slide, Koki. Um, so this is what our tree injection timeline looks like. And I apologize if my connection is unstable, I'm getting those alerts popping up. Um, another way to visualize this, so the adult CRBs will continue to live their lives before they come in contact with that lethal tree. Um, and then that's, that's why we, we note this, 
the steep decrease um, right as the trees become lethal, and then a more even tapering off as um, less and less adults are emerging from those breeding populations. So if we think about the CRB larvae, um, they're going to continue their lives as normal until that lethal level, and then slowly less adults will be um, laying eggs and creating more larvae. So we'll see gradual, gradually less and less um, CRB larvae and breeding sites. And then um, we're still doing research into the pesticides efficacy to see um, how long the crown will remain at that lethal level. Um, the uh, label states that pesticide can be reapplied at the one year mark. So it's an annual application. Um, we're not sure, but we assume that the um, pesticide reaches a lethal level and then be, and ta uh, tapers off at the end of its cycle um, to a non-lethal level before the one year mark. Um, so the lethal level of pesticide concentration in the crown is still unknown for a timeline, um, but thinking about the life cycle, um, this kind of helps illustrate where we would expect to see the, the biggest drop off in CRB population. And then another really exciting um, advancement of our program. So, you know, going back to the breeding and feeding, um, this is really affecting the breeding, the uh, breeding of coconut rhinoceros beetle. So we have a short little video of the live larvae in these um, bins. Basically, how a, the steam unit works is um, we take infested mulch and load it into these containers. Um, the containers are then loaded into the vacuum steam unit which uh, removes all of the air from the, from the unit. So that's where the vacuum part comes from. And then it injects steam. So um, because it's injecting steam after the vacuum, um, or the, the air is vacuumed out, then it can um, get steam into all parts of the mulch pile, which heats it to a temperature that's fatal to coconut rhinoceros beetle. Um, this is, probably one of the only methods that will work in heating a pile thoroughly uh, without burning it. So this is a, a great um, advancement for our program, um, especially in areas where uh, people don't want to um, remove mulch entirely or burn it. And burn permits can also be hard to acquire. So um, this steam unit has been great for our program so far. And then on the right hand side, you can see what some of those um, larvae look like once they're removed. Um, they, they're kind of dried and shriveled up. And we um, jokingly say that they look like prune mui, but if anyone has a better, um, less appetizing description for us, shoot it into the, the chat box below. And then as always, we like to round out our presentations with how the public can get involved or how you specifically can help. Um, the main thing to do is to report suspected tree damage, any palm movement, any CRB larvae or adults and trap issues. So um, we're a team of about 25 people and we can't be everywhere at once. So we really rely heavily on the public and um, I really appreciate their help in alerting us to new detections um, and reporting things that, that are suspicious to them. So thank you to everyone who's sent in reports to us in the past. Um, you can also help by not moving green material in or out of an infested area. So thinking back about those outlier catches that we talked about, um, the main mode of transport for that we believe is human vectored spread. So if we can limit the amount of movement of that material that's getting in and out of our infestment, infested areas, then hopefully we can stop the spread of CRB. Um, and then also raising awareness. So now that you've seen our presentation, you know, we hope that you're an advocate for what we do and we'll bring it up to whoever is willing to listen. And you can learn more about our program at our new website, um, www.crbhawaii.org.
and more of our contact information on the next slide. So mahalo everyone for tuning in today. Thank you so much for the presentations, uh, Koki and, and Kylie. Um, if you have, if you guys have any questions for them, please feel free to put them in the chat or in the uh, Q and A box. I think there is one question already there for you. Does the pesticide harm other insects? Um, yes, it's actually a common ingredient in um, flea and tick medicine for for dogs and cats. So it's less harmful to mammals. Um, but one of the reasons why we've only done the tree injections in areas that are heavily landscaped is to reduce that effect on pollinators, so bees mainly. Um, so we would recommend cutting off the inflorescences before um, the bees can, can pollinate it. Um, so that is something that we have to be careful for with these uh, pesticides that we use. Great, and also uh, Mary had uh, four questions. <laughs> so <laughs> <Wow>. the first one, <laughs> the first one is other than the moisture in in palm trees, is there another reason why CRB is attracted to palm trees? Are palm trees the only plant species and the CRB attacks? Kylie, I can take this one, give you a break from talking for a sec. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So. Uh, another reason why CRB attracted to palm trees, um, our understanding is it's just the way that, um, you know, the preferred food crop evolved um, as CRB did um, in their native range. But in other places where CRB has spread more widely, um, there has been damage on other plant species, including banana, um, papaya, sugar cane, um, something similar with the sugar inside that CRB are able to um, burrow into. Um, and recently on Guam, there has been reported news of a host shift to cycads as well. So it's definitely something that um, we're keeping an eye out for and uh, wouldn't want to see on Hawaii, um, in Hawaii or on Oahu. But um, so far, we've only seen it on palms, um, with the exception of one hollow tree that has in one of our highest catch areas where we saw some potential CRV damage. Um, and then I can see these other questions. Maybe I'll do the first two if you want to do the second two, Kylie. But um, sure. a way that people who are transferring mulch or woody materials to be able to detect coconut rhinoceros beetle, um, all of our services are free. So if you are moving mulch, um, especially from one of our high risk areas and you're concerned that it might have CRB in it, we'd be happy to schedule a visit for our canines to come out and see if they could detect anything um, in there. Other than that, when you're sifting through the material or loading it up, just visual inspection for any larvae that you might see. Um, the riskiest mulch is going to be um, any number of the factors like having palm material, having active decomposition, um, being of a smaller particle size, and then um, moisture. So those things, um, and if you see other larvae as well, mean that it could be more likely to be infested with CRV. But definitely check um, our website for the places that we've caught a breeding population of CRV because that's gonna be the highest risk location-wise. Yeah, and then the other question, so are there steps people should follow first before applying mulch from places like Hawaiian Earth Products or from outside of the area sources? So, um, Hawaiian Earth Products we've worked closely with and have inspected their processes. They do hot composting, so we're um, pretty confident in their treatment method that their material is safe for use. Um, I think, like Koki mentioned, that like uh, reporting anything that you find and making sure that you're looking through for any larvae is really important. Um, I guess it also depends too if you're working in a, a infested area or a non-infested area and really how long has that mulch been sitting before being used. So because coconut rhinoceros beetle are night active, if the material has been staged in say a high risk area for any amount of time, it is a much higher of a risk of um, harboring coconut rhinoceros beetle. Um, but if you're working in a, in a low risk area, um, got your 
material from Hawaiian Earth products and are applying it directly, um, I would say that's fairly low risk and, um, you know, mulch is so important. So we definitely don't want to tell people that you can't use mulch ever, but uh, really just being aware of what to look for, I think is a big help in um, anyone who's working with that material. And then the last question from Maria, or Marie, sorry, uh, the infested areas, are they allowed to move trees, mulch, or other woody materials out of the areas they are located? Um, so we're not a regulatory in, or, um, organization. We can't um, stop anyone's operations for what they're they're doing. You know, we rely on the goodwill of people and the hope that they want to uh, protect themselves and and protect Hawaii and stopping invasive species. So um, you are allowed to do whatever you want, but we would say that um, trees do pose a risk as well as mulch and other woody materials. Um, like Koki was saying with particle size, um, that is, is um, what we're looking for in terms of breeding sites and what's most likely a breeding site. But we've also found coconut rhinoceros beetle in uh, potted plant soil, for instance. So um, we're, we're constantly growing our understanding of what can be considered breeding material. Um, so I think any green material, I would be extremely cautious about moving out of an infested area um, into an uninfested one. And uh, the CRB response provides free services for inspection. So if you're concerned about moving material from an area, um, definitely contact us and we can arrange an inspection for you. Yeah, and then some other questions. Um, Koki, do you wanna take the next one? If there are any native lookalikes to CRB? Sure, yeah, so um, not, there's a, a couple of native lookalikes. We're actually working on a lookalikes page for our website and hope to have more of those research resources available um, more broadly soon. But um, I just pulled it up. So um, no native cousins in the same family, but native stag beetles. Um, are worth mentioning. So they're known to be found in Kauai, um, but they're extremely rare. So if you find one of those, um, you know, that's pretty lucky compared to finding a CRB. One that deserves mention um, in lookalikes in general is the Oriental flower beetle, which is a non-native pest species. Um, it's quite a bit smaller than coconut rhinoceros beetle, about one inch versus the CRB's two inches. And it has um, gold spots on its wing cases. So we do get a lot of public reports from those. Um, Elizabeth's nodding along because she feels some too. Um, but <laughs> those, um, those are more common to find. Um, and you can find more information about Oriental Flower Beetle by contacting us or checking out our website too. And then, and then um, another yeah, one question. question. And there's one in the chat box as well. Oh, okay, um, I, I'll answer this one from Monty. Um, can you describe what CRB damage to banana, papaya, cycads, and hala looks like? Is it similarly odd patterning to the leaves? Um, so because coconut rhinoceros beetle feed on the sphere and um, that uh, the unemerged palm fronds, um, the damage that we're looking for is once the leaves emerge. So I think that's basically to um, palms and the the way that they feed is kind of by burrowing so they use their forearms and their horn to create these boreholes um, so we haven't seen too much damage and don't have great examples of what it looks like on other species but uh, for the one hala that we found here in Hawaii that was damaged it was boreholes that we found. So um, that's mainly, I think, what the damage would look like on other um, tropical crops or species, but um, it's pretty rare. So I would um, take any photos, take any notes of what you're seeing and send it in to us and we can um, inspect it further if, if um, it seems like it might be coconut rain off. And then one more question here in the chat box. Uh, what are the distinguishing characteristics of the larvae besides size? Um, you definitely uh, found, you know, the main, main thing that we can determine if it is CRB, we're not really seeing any other larvae that are three to four inches long, you know, really shocking when people report that 
they're absolutely stunned at the size of the larvae, then um, we, of course, ask for pictures still, but um, we're not seeing too many other larvae that are of that size. Um, with the oriental flower beetle in particular, we get a lot of reports of that one um, because it is widespread and they look alike as beetles, but they really look alike as larvae, um, especially seeing that the CRB isn't always that three to four inch size and can be smaller earlier. But um, one thing we do look for on oriental flower beetle is they have a raster line, so kind of a brown line on their underside, and um, they also crawl on their back. But definitely any kind of larvae that people are suspicious of, um, we appreciate the reports and are happy to help field them. Um, so feel free to take pictures, um, describe what you found, and then and get in touch with us.